Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And this afternoon, I'm delighted to be joined by the Dream Team, uh, all the way from New Zealand, Ian Conroy. Um, dialing in from Japan, Liam Carrigan and our very own Lawrence Conley. We're all in here for an hour to talk about Celtic. What do you want to talk about? Let us know in the comments section and we will happily pour over and get the thoughts of the three Axrom contributors. First things first, Liam Carrigan, you love a football jersey. Um, we do like talking about it for time to time. There's obviously been a press release this morning, a teaser last night. Celtic have released a new jersey, which I think is one of the jerseys that we're never going to wear. Um, what is that thing of retro beauty you are wearing today? It's a Wales jersey, um, around about 1996, I believe. Um, it's a oh, he's frozen just as he was getting stuck in. To... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It is a cracker. It reminds me of uh, some of the, the great Welsh players that Celtic have had over the years. Um, who are they? Joe Ledley, John Hartson, Craig Bellamy, Adam Matthews. Is that about it? Have I forgotten anybody really obvious? Probably. Uh, and of course, um, that brilliant Welsh striker, Mark Hughes, whose testimonial Celtic participated in. Um, and the reason I brought that up first off the bat Fresh off the bat, it's the talk of social media. Lawrence Conley, another jersey released, is four or five jerseys a season. Are we bridged too far, or are you of the view that, listen, it's all about variety. You can buy them, you can leave them on the shelf. It's up to you. What's your yeah, take on it? It's up to people if they want to buy them or not, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if this is another limited edition one. I don't know if we're maybe bringing down that route. It's, they're certainly maximising the, the commercial aspect, aren't they? Get the fans to spend money. Maybe not so good at spending the money themselves, but uh, yeah. And there well, lies the rubs. The it. rub, is it? That's it. Yeah. This is the thing. This, this is the, the argument. This is where I see the frustration. When, when Celtic have um, a launch or um, a press conference, we are sent the, the press details, of course, uh, on the list with the, the fan media guys. And so we got that this morning, and I'm looking at it, the, the, it's two ways. The first thing is, do you like it? And the second one is, is it necessary? Now, Ian, I know you're a bit of a, a jersey aficionado. Liam loves a jersey. Um, and, you know, my take on it is we're loaded as a football club. Let's be let's be honest. We're absolutely wadded. Uh, the recent uh, financials would suggest that we're sitting on a pile of money. Lawrence touched on the fact that it would be nice to see some of that money on the park. Absolutely agree with you, Lawrence, especially when you get to this end of the season where you know injuries are piling up and every every single point is a prisoner my point is always this Ian right why do we have millions in the bank the fans that's it now you can be good at um you know buying and selling players your recruitment strategy i.e maximizing the value of a player selling them on for a profit I get it that's not why we've got 70 million quid in the bank though the reason we're as stable as we are as a football club is because the fans every single season buy season tickets by the Champions League packages and by merchandise. So the reason we're so rich is due to the punters. Simple as that. But we're going back to that well time and time again, aren't we, Ian? And asking for more. Yeah, we're ringing, we're ringing out that cloth, aren't we? You know, trying try to get blood, blood out of it. An already, you know, well over over um, um, harvested crop, really. It, it seems, I don't know if it's a contractual obligation with Adidas that, that they have to have so many jerseys out or so many... Things out. If you look at Arsenal, look at all the other, sort of the other teams that um, added a sponsor. We just we saying before we came on air, you know, about the David Rowe, Castle and Wright stuff, the, the the training stuff for Arsenal and the Stone Roses collaboration with with Manchester United. You know, it's just it's just another way of just more things that people don't need. You know, to to, to fleece the fans and perhaps it's more marketable with those teams. You know, the sort of the Far East and all that kind of you know the, the profile they have out there with the Premier League. But it seems that I would, I would imagine the vast majority of our jerseys are bought by fans on shore here you know and maybe in america but maybe not as far flung places you know um so it, it just seems a little bit you know it's it smacks of, of yeah it's fleecing the fans um and yeah the timing couldn't be worse really with the what's happening on the park the money sitting in the bank and we've not spent it you know the big thing uh timing is everything in football and we've said this time and time again when it comes to um you know winning masks a, a million deficiencies at times, Liam. And, it, it, you know, sometimes a, a football board can get let off the hook if you've got a manager like Ange who's winning trophies. And, you know, that discussion 
doesn't seem to be as highlighted on pay, yeah. on, on, on platforms like this and the press on social media because you're winning. You're, you're being excited by the football that you're watching, uh, Jota and Kyogo and everything's going well. Um, but regardless of all that, I just think in terms of the timing of this, I get that it now seems to be an annual event that we're going to be releasing a, an Irish Origins jersey because that's two years running now. We know that last year, cracking cracking jersey was never worn. So the, these are leisure shops, Liam. These these are like akin to going into a, the shop and buying a polo jersey. But it is quite a new phenomenon that a football club would deliberately release what looks like a football jersey and never wear it. I mean, you know, we're not going to wear it. There's no sponsor on it. It's one of these Origins kits that, again, it's, it's more of a leisure shirt, isn't it? I mean, if you take into account the... Uh the special version of the hoops that they brought out, which most fans seem to agree is better than the, the actual home shirt this season. Um, then you've got the uh, the Adidas 1994 kind of like thing with the side panels. Yeah, um, yep. right? yeah I think the Idol jersey, I think that was called. And then you've also got their uh, rainbow-coloured LGBTQ-friendly shirt that came out around Christmas time. That is eight shirts that the club have released within a calendar year. That is just, it's just obscene. I mean, <laughs> not, nothing speaks to our charitable Irish origins quite like the very worst excesses of late-stage capitalism. Eh? The, th the thing with that, and I'm trying to look at it from both sides, because I say to myself, right, Celtic is a brand. that there's, there's a want, and you're feeding that want. You know, the market is there. Um, and in the past, you'd maybe walk into the Celtic superstore and you see a range of T-shirts that were all about I don't know, generic. And maybe they're now looking at it and, and working in conjunction with Adidas saying, well, you know, instead of this range of generic stuff, let's make it more kind of football orientated, make them look like jerseys, have an Irish one, have the, obviously, the anniversary one at the beginning of the season. I get it. And then you've got the one-off ones. I know some of the London clubs have done things to raise awareness for knife crime. Absolutely brilliant, these things. If you're then pushing it towards a community initiative or, or a charity. I totally get it. But it does reek at the moment, Lawrence, of he's your money kind of thing. You know, that that is the thing that I think a lot, I've seen a lot of this on social media this morning. I, I'm into my, my jerseys, wrote a book about it, spent seven years poring over every fabric detail of the Celtic jersey. I love all that. But my my update could probably come out next year and there'd be about another 12 jerseys in it. only came out last year, the, the book. Listen, you know, we criticise the club where they, they, they don't do things well and they, they don't got operations working well. I, I, I think commercially, you know, if there's a market for them, get it out there. You know, it, it's, it's what they do with the profits that, you, you know, are they going to spend in the team, invest in the football side of the business? If they are brilliant, if I bring it out just to set more money in the bank, it's not so good. Is that um, why we're having this well, conversation, Lawrence? Is, is that why? Is that the whole crux of this? That's the only reason we're speaking about it. It's because of the yeah, frustration you know, that the money's lying there, isn't it? Look, listen, you see fake jerseys out there, you know, people making them and saying, oh, this is a Celtic jersey or, you know, it's not DHK or whatever. You, you see them out there and I can't fault the commercial department for saying, listen, there's a market there, we're going to make some money for the club. It's what the money, the club do with the money, you know. Yes. The, the, that's, I think, where everybody's a bit frustrated, you know, the chairman said he's frustrated. It was too hard to spend money in January. Uh, obviously, the manager's been frustrated, I think, on the quality front since he walked in the door. And it, you know, I know the recruitment team were working hard and, and some stuff they were trying to get away from Man City. But largely, you know, the manager says it's not quite, maybe the captain said that. It, it, how difficult it, is it to spend that money? Is it, you know, sometimes when, when clubs know you've got so much in the bank, they're going to charge you a wee bit more. You know, but they know, if they know their cash, cash direction, you, you'll need to take that plunge and pay it sometimes. Uh, you, you know, look, look at Lewis Ferguson now, founded at, what, 22 million? Mm. And, you know, I, I know the scouting team had recommended him, but uh, unfortunately Celtic, you know, didn't follow up on that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say, listen, it's terrible, because I think the commercial department's probably doing well in making money for the club. You know, it's just what they're doing with the money. You know, yeah. we want to start seeing it invested in the team. I think, Lawrence, you've, you've brought it right round to what the real discussion is, right? So if Celtic were to release a 1,000 items a year, 
but it was being reinvested in the team. We already know what we do in, in the charitable aspect through the foundation. We, we're not having this discussion, probably. You know, even if we're sitting there, still in Europe, chasing a treble, sitting top of the league, and you're happy with the, the product on the pitch, then the products in the shop don't merit a discussion. So I think I think you're spot on with that, Lawrence. That That is the big frustration, really, isn't it? Ian, but at the same time, you know, when, when you say, uh, you know, with regards to merchandise and brand, and there's a strong brand, there's a need for it. Again, I'm going to say that's because of the fans. That's not because some marketing genius or some commercial genius at Celtic has created that brand that is so sellable. The brand is out there because of the Irish diaspora, because there's pockets of Celtic fans all over the earth who would be willing to buy it. That wasn't through the hard work of a team of individuals over a period of time, breaking in new markets like Japan. Liam and I have had this discussion many, many times and building that brand through new and, and creative ways of, of selling Celtic. It's just simply due to the fact we've got a worldwide fan base who will buy the product, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, was, I, was, I wasn't trying to be disingenuous before I said, you know, but perhaps the, 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 Premier, the English Premier League clubs have more of a reach in terms of sales. Like Celtic are probably right up there. But we haven't got that exposure that they've got in terms of TV coverage and things like that with being the English Premier League. Um, so, sorry, what was the original question? Uh, it's all about, you know, selling the brand to a fan yeah. base as if we have created this worldwide global brand. Yeah. We haven't. We haven't. We've not been in all these markets chipping away at them for years and years until we've got a, a foothold in, in the, the market in different regions. It's simply because our fans are displaced in these regions, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think so. I think it, it, it's clear that you, wherever you go, wherever I've been, I always see a Celtic shirt, more than, more, than, more than one Celtic shirt, and we are all over the place, you know. Um, it, and obviously the Irish... Um, you know, the famine and things like that, with, 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 with that, you know, we were spread everywhere, you know, all over the world, all over the globe. So, and Celtic obviously are a, 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 a foundation. Um, I think it's not a bad thing that we've got Adidas when we had Nike before. I think their, their reach with, with them being the big juggernauts, it, it, it must help, it does, you know, it does help, but I don't, I don't think that they created this essentially for Celtic. You know, Celtic, Celtic generates this, this, this itself, as you said before. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I think I think the marriage between the two it, it doesn't do us any harm. Um, you know, if it was a Macron or, uh, or someone like that, I, I think it'd be less of an impact. Um, but you know, I think whatever company sponsored Celtic would would, would sell would sell would sell jerseys all the world. See, this is the thing, right? Whoever's got the deal with Adidas, um, you know, they'll be named and they'll be getting all the plaudits. But uh, Let's be honest, it's Celtic that got the deal, not the individual or the department. Celtic are going to sell regardless. And that is because of the heritage of the club, the success of the club, the worldwide global fan base and everything else. Irish Origins jersey is causing a bit of a stir. What are you saying in the comments? Wolf Tone, you're in. Four or five shots this season plus training gear. Unhappy with that, I would guess. Uh, Steve Lang, are we being thrifty? Because we have the highest paid manager in our history. No, you can, you can have the highest paid manager in your history. We can afford that. And you can still afford to go and buy players on top of that as well. Uh, Donny Tiny Hands, a 70 million quid is for the board and Desmond in the form of dividends. Get a lot of people uh, bringing that up as well. And, uh, you know, we mentioned it yesterday, Celtic fans own more shares co collectively and accumulatively than uh, Dermot Desmond. You know, that 36%, I think, he owns a uh, major shareholder. He doesn't own the club. John Sweeney, if the board did their job properly, there wouldn't be a title race with the amount of money in the bank and heads need to roll on the board if we lose the league. We're going to be talking about where we are, how you found uh, the most recent um, performance, Liam. And uh, obviously, we, Tony Haggerty and I took a wee wander around Paradise yesterday and we were speaking about our concerns in relation to the injury pile-up of you know, pivotal players, guys that you want to go to Ibrox with uh, in your start 11, i.e. Callum McGregor, Cameron Carter-Vickers, um, and Rio Atate. There are other injured players as well. Um, what was your thoughts on the game against Livingston? I know there's uh, a lot of water under the bridge already, and it's only Tuesday. Uh, mm. What was your thoughts on that? Was it? Are you taking the the, the kind of opinion that it was a classic cup tie end to end, or are you looking at some of the deficiencies in our own defence? Look, at the end of the day, we got the job done. We're in the semi final. That was if he offered us that before the game, based on the way we've been up and down in form recently. 
we'd all have taken it. But no, the the defence was very, very weak. Um, we looked extremely fragile. I guess for a neutral, it was entertaining because there's a sense that, you know, both teams looked like they could score every time they went forward. Um, and credit to Livingston, two very well taken goals. And they really played their part. Um, you know, obviously cup tie changed the dynamic, but I think we would all love to see more games like that at Celtic Park with teams coming and having a go. And, you know, Livingston didn't quite get it this time, but they almost did. And I think if you're a fan of a team like Livingston, St. Johnson, one of the perceived smaller teams in the league, I think you'd be happier going up the road getting beat 4-2 knowing you had a goal rather than losing 2 nothing, and it's a dull, doer, dire game of constant defending. Um, so credit to them there. But from our point of view, Dyson's performance individually was brilliant. I take, you know, I, I take something from that. I thought Iwata came on to a very good game, you know, was instrumental in the third goal. Um, and yeah, I, I think Kuhn showed a lot more than he's shown up until recently. So that was good to see. Um, yeah, well, just, you know, not a great game, but a, a few good individual performances you can pick out. And we're in the semi final, which is all that counts. We are, and we'll be talking about that draw. Uh, but you brought him up, so let's talk about Dyson Maida, Liam. Um, you're a specialist subject on Mastermind, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we were laughing during the game uh, on the match day bulletins. And, and again, Tony and I had a wee chat about it yesterday. Um, he can frustrate and he can dazzle in equal measure, all in the same game. He scores a hat trick, he misses three decent opportunities. The one where the ball comes back to him and goes through his legs, it's just like, this This is a man, right, who it, it can look like a world beater and a panel beater all in the same game. <laughs> um, what's his best position, Liam? Tell us that first of all. And how impressed were you, uh, not only with his hat trick, but with that that uh, flush of hair that he seems to be growing? He's going to reveal why he's growing the hair, hair apparently. Mm. Well, I, th- I think I think there's a weird inverse relationship going here, whereas Dyson's getting his hair back as I'm losing mine. But <laughs> anyway, um, he's a striker. And the weekend just proves that he is a, a striker. That is his best position. Yes, he can play left wing when he has to. We've tried him on the right wing, and I don't think it really works. Um, he's either a left winger or a striker for us, but I think he's best utilised as a striker. However... It was a question of Kyogo, Ida, or Maeda. He's still the third choice out of those three in terms of what we've got, if, you, if you're talking about a striker. So he fits into our system better as a left winger, but his best position, which you'll see if you watch the Japanese national team, is as a centre forward. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, often with, with Maeda, the frustration is the ball uh, that he plays. The, the final ball can be the frustration. But when he's playing on instinct, um, and we've seen it, obviously, at the weekend there. We've seen it as far back as the, the friendly game where he scored the first half hat-trick as well. That he's a, he's a very good instinctive player and he can slot the ball away. Um, and uh, obviously, we'll come back to the hair because he's, he's vowed to reveal his reasons for growing that back in. Uh, still got to get used to that. Um, what about yourself, Lawrence? Dyson Maida comes in. Um, the, the wingers were really, the, I think, the, the positive from the weekend. Their performance... Uh, was excellent. They seem to be playing a game that would have suited Kyogo. Then Kyogo comes on and they stop playing the ball. I don't know what that was all about, but uh, the, the wingers were quite impressive, weren't they? Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. Brennan's comments and Kuhn saying, you know, he, he lost a stone before signing for his due to illness and he, he's now just getting back up to late. So, listen, if he continues on, it's shown that kind of form. Again, it was only against Livy, but, you know, there's some delightful balls through that we uh, left over the top. You know, like it, it looks as if he'll create a lot of chances for us. Dies and scored three, could have had six. It's yeah, looks great with here. You know, can't wait to get even longer. You know, how many goals will we get? Yeah. But it's at the back. And and, and Brendan said, you know, Stephen Welsh was out of sick bed to play. I don't know what he definitely he's doing everything he can not to play Lager Bielka then, isn't he? If you're you getting a boy out of sick bed to play. Yeah. Liam, uh, unfortunately, you know, sitting deep for the first one. You, you, you know, he's playing everyone on, on side. It's it's not a, a, a partnership, I think, we'd have chosen at the beginning of the season or be happy to continue this season with. You know, it's it's one that's it's fragile, to say the least. Uh, exposed to easy balls over the top. 
they don't seem to get their distances right between them. You know, that they seem to leave either between each other or between the fullback and outside. They seem to leave gaping holes. Uh, so I don't know what's happening with CCV, but, you know, we need them back and pretty soon. I don't know how far back away Rocky is, but yeah. We've not had uh, a lot of luck, I suppose, this season with injuries. You know, you've had you know, McGregor's out now, CCB, can you missing for most of it. You've had Rio out. So, yeah, I can see why Brendan was maybe saying it's been a difficult season for him in terms of injury. Uh, but, you know, go through, as Liam said. You're in the semi-final, that's all that really counts. You know what I've seen is what won the Cup some years when we've had absolutely horrendous games and, and sneaked a one, one now. This one as well as a bad defence, and let's be honest, we might have scored four, but on the chances created, we could have scored ten. So the finishing work for ourselves wasn't wasn't top notch. We should have ten more of our chances. But like it's our Morrison says, you know, the team that wins the league's normally got the best defence, and we can't be leaking leaking goals at the back and, and giving away chances like we are just now. No, absolutely not. Um, on on the subject of wingers, Ian, uh, Dyson made us come in for a lot of criticism this season. Uh, and I think, you know, it gets to the point where people start trying to come up, up with a theory around why they talk about the transition from Lance Postacoglu to Brendan. We've heard he doesn't look happy. All the body language, the experts come into play. But th- there, was a, there was a sign there for me at the weekend of a player who actually, he's never an established player in this, this team. You know, there's no, there's no excuse for him not to step up. And I think guys like Maeda have to step up now because we do have a lot of players in that squad who don't have the Celtic experience. They don't have the experience of getting a, a league title over the line, of winning trophies, of being a successful team. Maeda does. And I think that stepping up at this point, and I, I want the same from Matt O'Reilly. I want that type of player who knows what it is all about to be a successful team to step up. I, I don't think it's enough now to say we've got three leaders and we've got a few established players. I think guys like Maeda have to step up as well, Ian. Yep, right on on that one. Um, it, man, a few words, obviously, is, is the kind of the, um, the the way he exudes himself, you know, the way he kind of carries himself on the pitch. He doesn't really say a lot. He, he, he usually doesn't even celebrate, you know, that sort of ice through the veins um, recently. And, um, I don't know, like, playing up front, um it has worked at times, and it's not. You know, he's, he's just as likely to hit the green brigade as he is the back of the net. You know, um, and it's that's the frustrating thing with him. Um, but perhaps if his confidence builds, he starts scoring more goals. He might, he might sort of, he might take take the, take the grip of the team. You know, he might and, and, and sort of school these younger players or these newer newer players yeah. on what it takes to play for Celtic. Because yeah, I watched the pod yesterday. You know, and you were quite right. It's the two fullbacks, you know, in, in the absence of Calmac, it's the two fullbacks that are actually doing that. You know, they're they're they're, shout, they're, they're telling they're, they're talking players through the games, mm-hmm. and they're, they're 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 setting that expectation level, um, and yeah, I think I think Dyson should be another one of those guys as well. Whether the, whether it's a language barrier or whether he's just naturally isn't that type of character, um, but yeah. he certainly leads by example with the, with the, with his energy. And the the, the the effort that he puts in every game, you just can't fault him, you know. It's like having two players. No, you're right. I mean, he is the guy we know. He, he presses, he harries. His engine is unbelievable. Um, a, a nightmare to play against, I guess. But it seems to be most of this season, uh, Liam, have either had no winners on form or just the one. You know, let's not forget, Palmas had moments this season where he's, he's been very creative um, he's assisted, he's scored, and he's done it at the highest level. He's done it in the Champions League. Uh, but then he seems to go off the boil. You're waiting for someone else to step up. And at the moment, I'm looking at Maeda thinking, right, he's he stepped up. And then Kuhn, as Lawrence mentioned earlier on, Kuhn had the best game that he's had in the Celtic jersey, which wouldn't be hard because he wasn't great leading up to that. I know that when he signed, he had some kind of uh, dental treatment that he had to go through, missed his first game uh, unexpectedly because of that. Maybe just getting up to the speed and the sharpness that he needs to obviously make an impact. Uh, but it really is a case of all season we've had wee pockets where certain players have, have stepped up. Matt aurelli has been sensational at points this season, and he goes off form a wee bit now. Bernardo's had his wee patch, you know, which took in the last Rangers game. Then he loses a bit of form, um, and it doesn't help. It seems a wee bit fragmented at the moment. 
Liam, where some players are playing, like it's a handful of players every game and it doesn't seem to click where the whole team comes together. That That's the frustration, I think. Yeah, I think it speaks to just a kind of a, what seems to be a lack of cohesion at the moment throughout the entire squad. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not, I, look, we, we can talk about it being the manager or being the players. I think it's a bit of both, but we're not clicking. We we clicked uh, for about an hour against Dundee a couple of weeks ago, and that's the last time I remember us really doing it. And in the New Year game against Rangers, that's that, those two performances, the only two from the last sort of three months, I would say, were really quite memorable. Um, it's it's inconsistency, and it, like you say, certain players will produce it, and other players won't, and those other players will produce it, and the other player and the first players will fall away. So we need to try and get consistency. But the thing is, this season when we've played Rangers, we've done it when it's mattered. Yes. So I still believe it will come together when we play them. And once we beat them, all this mess goes away. You know, I said that in August, just before we played them the first time. I said it again on here just before the December game. I said, whatever trouble we've got right now, beat them and it goes away. And it's the same again. We win this game in a couple of weeks' time. We're top of the league again, and everything's everything's not fine. But everything will seem fine comparatively. <laughs> no, it does. It does. It gives it a gleam. Um, it, it really does give it a veneer of invincibility for a few weeks, um, and hopefully that momentum can continue as well. I have received, um, I've received a a statement actually from the Jimmy Johnson uh, Charitable Trust, uh, as you will know. The Jimmy Johnson Academy and Jared Double Trust is based at Cathkin Park. Um, we have in the past had interviews with them and with Agnes Johnson as well. Uh, they're on the YouTube channel. If you want to have a, a wee look through the archive on the YouTube, in terms of the audio, we are uploading any of the audio uh, that hasn't automatically crossed over since we moved our, our platform recently. And the work they've been doing down there is incredible. I was down there this morning. And uh, they were they are in discussions with uh, the Cruyff Foundation uh, because they are going to be um, advancing the space that they have to the left of the, the football pitches for a mugger. Um, and uh, there are 300 of these worldwide, um, which are financed by the Cruyff Foundation. So it's a partnership. Um, and, and it's an incredible thing when you see the plans you should pop down there um, because it's a, an area of land that's basically unused. It's all vandalised and then you're going to have um, a facility that can be used by the community and there's nothing better than seeing kids kicking a ball about, is there? Uh, something that we don't see enough of. Anyway, the statement is in relation to the fact that um, they have had, the Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust, have had um, planning permission to erect a fence around the football park, which is situated at Cathkin. Uh, Cathkin obviously has a rich history in Scottish football. Um, many, many great Celtic players have played there. Some have even signed on the park. Um, but of course, when Third Lanark uh, went bust and disappeared from view back in the late 60s, it was 1967, wasn't it, Lons? 1967. Um, it, uh, it, it took a long, long time for it to, to get back to its uh, former glory. But the Jimmy Johnson had been in there for about 15 years. Um, there has been opposition to the planning, and this is the statement that I've just received. We are disappointed by the reaction to Glasgow City Council's decision to grant planning permission to erect a fence around the existing football pitch situated within Cathkin Park. Against the backdrop of council cuts and facility closures, we anticipated the news of this significant investment in local infrastructure would be welcomed by the wider community. The permission allows us to erect a fence around a designated existing football pitch, which has been subject to well-documented misuse and vandalism over the last 15 years. The primary function of the fence is to protect the surface and is in keeping with the majority of surrounding local sports facilities. We understand the concerns raised and want to reassure the wider public that the proposal only affects a designated playing field area. That's a grass pitch area adjacent to the pavilion which is 8,971 square metres, with the wider public park and gardens actually totaling 43,748 square metres, unaffected and fully accessible to the general public. So 
I mentioned uh, the mugger earlier. This doesn't take into account that. That's a, an ongoing development. The football park that is used by the Jimmy Johnson Academy um, is something that's going to be fenced off. It's going to protect the turf. It's the kind of thing you see all the time, all over the country. That's what the planning permission is for. There's been some opposition. And the Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust want to ensure uh, everybody that the wider area will still be used to the public. Now, Lawrence, you're a Glasgow boy. Cathkin Park, steeped in rich football history in Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, listen, it's part of Matthew Mars. Uh, you know, he does the Celtic history walks. So he, he takes that in. Talks about right. the, uh, the early games Celtic have won there. Second Hamden. Remember, remember right, there's another Hamden down in Coburn Hill. It's tenants on it now. Betty be takes you through the games. Great. I mean, look out for Matthew Mars' box. Great to go along, follow him in history. Uh, but Listen, they're doing something that's great for the kids, and I suppose you get critics everywhere, don't you? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. You keep complaining about protecting a football pitch so as it's still going to be in a fit condition to play football on. Yeah. You know, what is it you want to do with the football pitch that, that you can do in the, the rest of the surrounding area? But you, you know, they, they've put a lot of work in, in improving the ground, and council doesn't have the funds to run out these things for the kids. No. Uh, and where I am, you know, seeing the football pitch is getting taken away, which there doesn't seem to be as much opposition to. So you think somebody actually securing a pitch for the young exactly. kids would, uh, would be a positive news story. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, in High Valley Field, anybody who's tuning in from the villages, we used to have something called a 5 right? And it was a tarmac football park, which was great for slide tackles, of course. And there was a big fence around it right and so you could you could use that to your advantage it was a crack in the area and Valleyfield has a great tradition of producing footballers George Conley being the best and most famous footballer coming out of the village but there have been many many others and I, I drove past it fairly recently and I was saddened to see that the fence had been taken down you know so the chances of you being able to get a game of football without hitting somebody's you know fence window car whatever are slim. So you're absolutely right, Lawrence. We live in a country that is steeped in football, Ian. Here we have a charitable trust doing good for the community, and all they want to do is protect their grass football park. Only in Scotland would we oppose that. Would anyone oppose someone trying to do good for youth football in Scotland? Yeah, it's uh, it's all too common, isn't it? I think you know the kind of the, the bureaucracy of, of of local authorities and and, and government organisations. It, there's no round of reason. Um, fairly clear, I haven't got a vested interest um, in this, or you know, it's not a high priority. But there's a fish that fish is done uh, is 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 rife everywhere. Um, what can you do about it? The problem I've got with this, I always go back to. I did an interview with Jock Brown. Um, but because we did it in a coffee shop, the sound quality was so bad. I never ever put it on the channel. I might be able, I might be able to get it cleaned up, and I'll put it. It was a really good interview. Uh, but since then, Amy Canavan done one for the channel anyway, so she probably covered this. But what Jock told me, and this this brings your knowledge of Japanese football into it, Liam. Jock Brown told me that um, obviously when his brother took Scotland through the World Cup in 1998, um, after that, big prize money for playing in these tournaments, but also there was um, there was some funding from the lottery, etc. And Scotland had something like 65 million quid, the Scottish Football Association, at their disposal. And what Craig Brown wanted to do was he wanted to, to create little pockets all over Scotland whereby there was, you know, the all year round, the all weather football parks that could go and play. And he wanted to make it free for kids to play. So wherever you were, within a radius, you could find somewhere to go and play a game of football. And Craig Brown proposed that to the SFA. The SFA, of course, said, no, you're all right. And they put all the money into Hamden and they redeveloped Hamden at 65 million quid. Um, and it's a, a football stadium I have no love for, I've got to say. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, guys. But, you know, the reason I brought that up is that I was watching the... You'll be able to tell me it because you're a student of the Japanese game. It was one of the World Cup finals where they went 2 nothing up against Belgium, you'll remember, at half time. I think Belgium beat them three or four two, but three two, yeah, three two. They were sitting at, at half time, Liam, and they were talking about how did this happen? How did J <laughs> Japan all of a sudden become a force in football? And it was pointed out by one of the panel um, that, in actual fact, there came a point 
where there was all these badminton and tennis courts all over Japan that were disused. And whoever the, the equivalent of the Ministry of Sport was said, you know what we'll do? We'll change them into football parks. 20 years later, Japan start producing, or they've been producing footballers ever since, if you like, because we invested in grassroots football. Craig Brown wanted to do it with Scotland in 98. What happened? We've never <laughs> we've never qualified for a World Cup final since then. And we didn't we didn't put it into that, we put it into the prawn sandwich brigade. I mean it speaks volumes, doesn't it, Will? I mean the ultimate and the, the ultimate sort of thing for Japanese football is that when the J League was founded in 1993, so 31 years ago, um not long after that, the J, the, the JFA unveiled a 100 year plan. And the aim was to win the World Cup within 100 years, right? I know that sounds mental, right? But they are, you know, 30 years into that plan now. And they've hit every every target so far. You know, it was like, we want to be consistently getting to World Cups within 10 years. They did mm-hmm. that within five years. Mm-hmm. We want to be getting beyond the first round of the World Cup consistently. They've achieved that at the last three tournaments. Um, you know, they are... They're, they're hitting these targets because the targets were realistic and it was long term. And like you say, they invested in the infrastructure. Um, I mean, you know, my the, the kids that, that I teach at school, the, the football club has got some amazing talent there. Um, you know, on a par with probably, I would say, most academies at, at younger, you know, sort of younger boys level in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is just a regular high school. It's not, you know, it's, it's nothing outstanding. Um, but in Japan, that's the norm. And it's been 30 years in the making. And <laughs> don't be surprised if they do win the World Cup in the next few decades. I mean, I really think that that is good. I mean, 125 million population. Once it clicks, there's enough people there to produce a world-class team. Yeah, and it's progression, isn't it? And and yeah. I think a lot of the time within Scottish football, we fail to progress. And it's that grassroots investment. That's exactly what the Jimmy Johnson are doing right here. They're investing time, money, effort into the youth of Scottish football, and people don't want it to happen. I find it absurd. Um, Robbie, you're coming in. Thank you for supporting the channel, Robbie. No point making an issue over the merch. Most clubs doing it right now. Adidas and Arsenal doing the very same every year. Adidas contracted, end of the day. Get used to it while Adidas are on our shirts. I think that's one side of the argument, and Lauren said that at the top of the show. Um, Stephen Sloan, good to see you, my friend. We've had 13 clean sheets in 39 games this season. That's a shocking start for a club the size of Celtic. Hearts have had more clean sheets. We are going to be talking about the state of Celtic's defence. But let's talk about Aberdeen. We've drawn them in the semi-final with the Scottish Cup, Lawrence Conley. Um, the word basket case is used quite a lot to describe a football club. And uh, at this moment, I think Aberdeen are a basket case of a football club. They, they are. I mean... They are now looking to appoint their fourth permanent manager. Was Neil Warnock permanent? He was, no, permanent. He was, yeah, he was no, permanent. He was permanent for about three weeks. Um, so, I mean, when I look at Aberdeen, I regard them as one of the, the, the biggest clubs in Scotland. I think that they have underperformed for years and years. Not to say they can't knock us out the cup. Anything can happen. Um, they're in the hunt for another manager, Lawrence. And Neil Lennon's name, seems to be in the frame. Do you think it would be a marriage made in heaven? Look, look listen, I think Lenny would do well with him. I think he, you know, he, he won a trophy in Cyprus. He, he, he got hips promoted, so he'd done well there. And down south, and down, and there was no money in the club that, that almost went bust. And obviously he's relatively Celtic. He, his last season wasn't good, but he, you know, he won some trophies with us, some great results in Europe. He's obviously a manager that knows how to win things. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be great for them. Uh, hopefully he's not appointed before the, the player as in, in the semi. Don't want a, a new manager bounce or anything. But, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think it'd be a great move for Lenny, you know, get back into football. But I don't know why he's been out so long. So, you know, we're expecting Warnock to be there till the end of the season. He's obviously decided... Well, you know, but Aberdeen both have decided yeah, we're not keeping you that long. I, I don't know what they wanted them to achieve, you know, in such a sort of short space of time when they brought them in. Uh, but we'll see who comes in next. But I think it'd be a great move for Lenny. Well, it sounds to me, 
Reading between the lines, of course, uh, looking at what Neil Warnock actually said after the game, where he's resigned and stepped down, that it could well just be a timing thing whereby the progression of the application of whoever it might be, it might not be Neil Lennon, has progressed quicker than they expected. And they think, right, you know what, we'd much rather this manager came in for the rest of the season, Warnock has stepped down and they move on. Of course, there was a suggestion, Ian, that uh, Neil Lennon might have become the Ireland boss um, Aberdeen, Neil Lennon Is it a good match for you? And as Lauren said, let's hope it doesn't happen before the Cup game Because it would, it would give them a boost I think he I, mean, I love Lenny, I think he would be a good A good shout for, for Aberdeen um, I read today that was Mark, Mark Fotheringham He chucked his, he sort of talking himself up as well uh, Was it Mark Is it Mark, Mark Fotheringham? Yeah, um, yeah. Is he yep. Working under Felix McGatt or in Germany And under Klinsman for Korea, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd strongly endorse Lenny for for, for, a, for a job at Aberdeen or any other club, to be honest. But I think I think he could handle Aberdeen no problem. Obviously, he's been at Celtic. He knows he knows how to how to win, you know. And he's he's been obviously with, 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 with Hibs, you know, a more unfashionable club, but he, he did well at Hibs um, on limited funds. So I think I think I think he'd be a good I think he'd be a good fit for Aberdeen. Um, yeah, maybe at the end of the season. I think not, um, not before we play them. No, not before we play them. I think it is something that would give them a, a swing in momentum. Um, I think what happened here is that Barry Robson seemed to do well on an interim basis, Liam. Barry Robson, I don't know, is he a cult hero? I'll, I'll love to give that. Um, I, would, a I remember seeing him score a cracking goal against, I think it was Barcelona in the Champions Barca. League a few years yeah, ago. The header. Yeah. Yep. Scored, he scored with his first touch of the ball for Celtic. It was mm -hmm. a free kick against Aberdeen. So Barry Robson started off very, very quickly. It turned sour. Um, obviously, last season was shocking for Aberdeen. Uh, Liam Scales was part of that side, uh, obviously, that got knocked out against Darvel, one of the, if not the worst. Cup upset in Scottish football history. And they find ourselves manager list. Why are we talking about it? That's because we're facing them in a Scottish Cup semi final, and um, a, a very successful Celtic player and manager may well be in the running for the manager's job. Liam, both Lawrence and Ian reckon it would be a good move for both parties. What do you think? Yeah, totally agree. Um, I think Aberdeen is a sort of club that needs a rocket up them, and Lenny's the type of manager to deliver that. Um, I also think that it's it's within Scottish football. It's him back doing the sort of job that we know he can do. But also, it's far enough away from that central Scotland fishbowl that he can still have a peaceful life with his family. And I think the Aberdeen fans would would look after him as well. I think they are Aberdeen fans generally. I mean, I'm I'm you know I'm generalising here, not all of them obviously, but. I think, generally speaking, Aberdeen fans are quite similar to us in the sense that they, they appreciate no-nonsense characters. They appreciate guys who wear their heart on their sleeve, and that, that's Lenny. So I think I think he would do very well up there. Yeah, I think it seems like a decent move. And as Lawrence pointed out, probably the, the only team that he's not had any kind of success at was Bolton. But mm. if you're talking about, about basket cases at a club, that was a completely different scenario because um, I think he's spoken, Lawrence, about his... Um, his mistake was they didn't do the proper due diligence before going down there, him and the Albi. And they've gone down and the, the club is a shambles. And often what happens is you're kind of tabbed with that brush if you're the unsuccessful manager, but you were up against it at that time as well. Um, did, he, did he sell Luca Connell to us, though? Or did we buy it? Did we buy him from... Was that after or, or during the Lenny tenure? I need to check that. I think it was after. Because Colin Watt made a bet with me on this show that Luke O'Connell would play for Celtic's first team. And I think he bet me 20 quid. And I still not received it. He was going to give it to charity. Oh, no, maybe, maybe, maybe what we missed out of the living game was uh, young Kelly. You know, another solid performance from him. You know, and Ludum and Brendan's kind of comments about bringing young players through. That's something that needs to happen. Yeah. Right. You brought it up, Lawrence. You brought it up. Um Bernardo, I've already said, hasn't been playing that well, I don't think. Uh, I'm a fan of Awata, and I think that he was poor against Hearts, but Celtic as a team were poor against Hearts. McGregor, we don't know yet. We're hoping that the next press, press conference the question is asked, when will Callum McGregor be back? Do you play Kelly? Do you start him? I thought the, I thought the opportunity was there. 
to start him against Livingston? Lawrence, do you, do you throw him yeah, in? Yeah, I, I, I would have started him against Livy. Uh, listen, Bernardo, I know we've kind of said, well, not the six million sign. I suppose he was this, because he's the option to buy with six million. We've kind of hedged our bets with him, and he's definitely not looking at the money, has he? What Kelly's shown, yeah, I'd be starting him alongside the Watt in the centre. Uh, it, for me, you know, even home over Bernardo, I just, with Bernardo, I'm, I just don't see enough there that uh, he should be starting in front of those boys. Just now, he's been so hot and cold, I don't know if he's really got the fight in him. And I, I think we're going to need players that have got that bit of dig. I think, you know, young Kelly, well, I think uh, home has shown he has, but, you know, the, the glimpses we've seen him. So, yeah. Next game for me, I'd, I'd be starting Kelly and a lot in the midfield. Like, you know, take it, Callum's out and Rio's not back, I think, until the Rangers game. So, yeah. So, what La Lawrence would be bold. He would start the, the young guy who's come in and made some cameo appearances from the bench. He's obviously made an impression, scored a goal, of course, against Dundee. Ian, when he, he replaced Callum McGregor, is the time right? Or do you think, I mean, I think it's two pronged. What would you do? What do you think Brennan would do? Because I don't think Brennan will do that. I think he'll stick with Paolo Bernardo. I think he will as well. Yeah. Um, it's it's a funny one, Bernardo, because he, he did. Obviously, we all we all thought we we we, we kind of we found another gem. Um, I don't know whether the success of Jota, you know, he was so instantly successful coming from Benfica, has maybe gone against Bernardo a little bit as well. You know, he's not could he ever live up to the you know. You know the, 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 how well Jota did. Um, I still think there's a player there with with Bernardo, um, so I don't see it as a, as a problem. I'm sticking with, with, with Bernardo, to be honest. But um, I'm not seeing all the games. I'm not seeing all the full games, so I'm just sort of relying on highlights some of the times. So you guys have got a better idea than me on that one. But um, yeah, I think with uh, Rangers on the horizon. You're going to be looking at the lineup that has been successful so far against them in many ways, Liam. Unless someone is so far out of the picture, like Lagerbelk, obviously, we know he started the first game. Mm. Bernardo against Rangers, I thought, peaked in terms of his time at Celtic. That was his best yeah. performance, man of the match performance, scored a brilliant goal. And then since we've come back after the break, he's not been able to recapture the form. And I think that there are some players who can be quite slow burning. I thought Moy was a bit like that. I thought, see if Moy was injured, and then it would take him a wee while to get right back up to that mm. standard that made him an absolute standout. So I'm looking at that, and I'm trying to consider that, and I think that in terms of throwing Kelly in, will it be in the back of Brendan Rodgers' mind that if we don't win, that is going to be the instant focus? Oh, you've thrown in a kid. And it might actually affect him, because I don't think... We've developed some of the young guys as well as we might have done. I spoke about Mikey Johnson the other day, and I know that a lot of the onus is on the player. He said bad luck with injury. However, I don't think we've developed him enough. We're only now putting him out last season and this season on loan, for example. So I think we've got to have that in mind, the development of the player, throwing him in at a time like this when the stakes are high. Of course, the counter-argument would be, why not? We used to do it with guys like Peter Grant against Rangers and various other young guys. What's your thoughts on it? Well, the thing is, we play St. Johnson next, right? And if he's going to have any sort of um, impression against Rangers, he's going to have to show that he can do it against St. Johnson first of all. So I think that's a, a good sort of a good ground to bed in if you're gonna if you're gonna start uh, start him. Better to start him at home against one of the weaker teams in the league before you go to play our biggest rivals. Uh, for the championship at their stadium mm -hmm. um, so I would definitely say if if we're even considering putting putting Kelly in against Rangers he needs to start get him get him comfortable with that notion of st being a Celtic starter before we go there and looking at the players that are injured I think that if going just say going into the you know fast forward a couple of weeks go into the Rangers game right if we have, you know, Carter Vickers, McGregor and Hatate ready to come back, great. But I would like to ideally see two of those three back before that. Because what you want is if we have one big player that they think isn't going to play and we announce the day before, by the way, Cal Mack's playing or CCV's playing, 
what a massive boost that is for us, and it puts it puts the frighteners on them. Um, you can do that with one player. I don't think you can do it with three. I think mm. that's too risky. Pitching in three players who are probably not fully match fit, um, and certainly not match sharp, uh, going to going to the debt dome for the the, the the league decider is a bit mm, a bit dodgy. But risky. Paddy Lavery, welcome to the show. Always great to see you, Paddy. Uh, turned 50 this year, did Paddy Lavery. Afternoon all. Thoughts on the new top? We've given you some thoughts on it. Have we given you the thoughts on it? I don't think we did. Do you actually like the jersey, Lawrence? We spoke yeah, about the financial we... element of it, didn't we? Look, listen, obviously, uh, you know what? It used to be, uh, I remember when I was going back to Cronus and Scott's house, everybody would support Celtic and then obviously Sky TV came, came along. And you know, people start getting English teams, and I think just now it's a market. Celtic need to look at you need to look to produce stuff for the Irish market. You know, it's certainly you know, a country that virtually everyone was a Celtic supporter would be the first team. Certainly not been the case now for the last 20 25 years. I, I like the jersey, I remember the, the green one with the pipe pinstripes. We had, uh, I think we see pictures of Frank the Guardian in it. Uh, we had before it'll be a new bit, mate. You, you'll know the jersey better than me. I'm talking about with the white v neck. There was yeah. the white alternative, yeah. White with the, the green pinstripe was the alternative one, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's reminiscent of that, you know. Well, I buy it, maybe, you know, I was open at Celtic Shop and the pop on Saturday, bought a couple of things, so yeah, probably next thing we'll pass in if I'm in, you know, have a look at it, maybe. But yeah, I like Jersey. Football aficionados, uh, Liam Carrigan, what's your take on it? You're wearing quite a funky Welsh jersey there. What do you think of the new Celtic one? Um, I it's it's nice enough. It's it's fine. Um, I've just got a question for the Celtic board though, because we know they listen to the show, obviously. Um, since uh, since we're so proud of our Irish heritage and we're you know we're actively pushing that to sell a new shirt, I assume it's okay to sing rebel songs at the game now. Well, fair. I, I think Liam that in terms of some of the the feedback I was looking at this morning, it was around. We, we can't celebrate it just to sell merch. This is Aye. the thing. We can't celebrate it just to sell merch. We should celebrate it every single day. Uh, yep. And it should be part of our very fabric as a football club. Um, yeah, and they do listen. They do listen. Uh, I got some feedback on that last Monday, but we'll not get to that. Ian, <laughs> with regards to the jersey itself, in terms of the fashion element of it, some of the pictures of the jerseys that are in my book used to belong to you. You were into the old Celtic match one jerseys. What do you actually make of it? Paddy Lavery's asking, do you like it? Is it something you would wear? I've bought more jerseys living away from Scotland than I ever ever did for a long time, since I was a, a kid, probably. So maybe I might I might end up getting it. Um, I, do I like it? It's all right. Damn it with faint, faint praise, really. It's not... I, I think I would have looked nicer with a V-neck, I was saying on the group chat before. Um, I like... Pinstripe, you know, it is reminiscent of that of that Umbro one. It was at eighty three, yeah. Um, yep. When they had the white one in the reverse as well, so it's like they've, they've nearly got it right, but not quite. And it, obviously, it needs the or the, the the orange on it to be, you know, to celebrate our Irish heritage. But I think the orange spoils it. <laughs> um, it's, it's the orange on the green that seems to be a bit. Yeah, the way they got it in that pot, maybe it was a piping in the middle. Yeah, might be all right. Um, sounds finickety, but. It just doesn't look that nice on the eye at first glance, you know, and that's usually a, a quite a a good way to sort of if something grabs you straight away, you know, it's normally something it's normally positive, isn't it? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And I agree with that. Uh, thanks everybody for their financial um, and also their fashionable input today. We've been talking money. We've been talking fashion. Jungle Lion, welcome back. Maybe if the club bought the three players required and were now ahead in the league, the new Celtic jersey would be hopping off the shelves and get their money back instead. You have this nonsense this morning. Yet yeah, there's definitely been a backlash. I think it's safe to say um, this morning after the the reveal. Robbie, no point making an issue over the merch. Uh, yep, yeah, we've already spoken about that. Thanks for your your comment, Robbie. Paddy, you're back in. Matt O'Reilly could have at least cracked a smile in the promotion photo. He was looking all moody, wasn't he? All dark and moody and deep. Um, that's our Matt O'Reilly. Jonathan Brown. No matter the outcome of this season. Whether we win the league or not, we can't give the board a free pass again. It's human nature that when things are going well, sometimes you don't like to look under the bonnet. It's like driving a motor. It's only when it breaks down that you start to try and look for the root of the problem. 
Franny Ferun the Corner. You keep changing your name, Franny. What exactly are our custodians saving the money for? Well, if it's a rainy day, the rainy day is about to happen if we don't win this league. Robert Highland, Celtic declared £72 million in the bank back in September 23, to which we added, let's not forget, £25 million from the Champions League and a further £10 million from January and recent player sales. Gross negligence not to have strengthened in January. And that takes us to the next part of our discussion. On the point of which we were talking about Aberdeen there, uh, guys, I'll just get a... A wee uh, round the room here, starting with yourself, Lawrence. Um, talk of Lewis Ferguson moving from Bologna for 22 million quid. Um, and a lot of Celtic fans, myself included, I would have taken him when he was at Aberdeen. Uh, I would have gone for him. Someone pointed out in the, the social saying, oh, his dad would never have let him sign for Celtic. Well, I was um, in the, the studio to do off the ball with, with Stuart and Tam. And I was standing outside waiting with a cup of tea. And Derek was standing there, and I asked him the question, and he said it would have been fine, but there was never an offer. They never had an issue with Celtic buying Lewis Ferguson. So I think there's two sides of the, the debate here, Lawrence. The Lewis Ferguson that's leaving Bologna may not have been the Lewis Ferguson had he stayed in Scotland and signed for Celtic or Rangers. So that's the first yeah, part. He needed many. that development over in Italy, didn't he? Yes, it's true, and you could say the same for John John again, you know, when, when he was moving, to, is he the, you know, the John again at Hibs, is it the, the guy at Villa? Although that was some sending off at, at the weekend, but listen, I know, I know the scouts, Celtic scouts certainly recommended uh, going after Ferguson, but uh, the club didn't pursue it, didn't put a bid in. So, make it up what you will. And it, I, I suppose it's a squad, squad management, we've talked about this all, all, on here before, you know, how many players can you have? We've had a huge squad just now. Lots of them not contributing. You know, it's, it's all right. We could have bought him, we could have bought him. So what impact would that have had on our squad? And I, I, think they, I don't know if Brennan's got a plan. He seems to be excited uh, for next season. Uh, but we, we need to manage a squad better and, and have the relevant pathways for players that we buy and players that, that, that we rear ourselves. You know, and it, it looks like Kelly's going to get a chance. Uh, I've liked what I've seen of Kelly coming in. You know, I've heard Jim Wallace saying you, you shouldn't be relying on kids, but maybe so. But you know, he's there because he's good enough, because the manager mm -hmm. thinks he, he, he's good enough to be playing. Uh, you, know, it, you know, if not now, when? You know, the, he's a guy we're trying to persuade to sign, sign another contract. He comes out and says, can't even get a game against St Johnston when they've had two decent Jones and scored a goal. And you've you know, got a pile of injuries, yeah. Where's my future here? Sorry, why am I signing? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I definitely think Ferguson, I think, if they signed, would have been on to develop with this, you know, it would have been different, you know. But I, I think he's a player that's been worth taking a chance on. You, we've got to look to Europe, you know, where's a, a club reared contingent and a, a Scottish player's coming for, for a quota? You know, it's another reason I went, would have went for a shank with over Majowski uh, in the winter transfer window. But yeah, you know, scouts recommended Ferguson. I think we could all see he was a decent player, good prospect in Scotland. But for whatever reason, I don't know why the, the club didn't, you know, pull up on the recommendations. Maybe they thought they had enough midfielders at the time. It could just be as simple as that. Say, listen, I've got, you know, you know, 10 midfielders and they've all got a long time to run in their contract. I mean, look at Boston Law down, down south now, he's moved back forward. You know, if, if he wasn't already signed to us, we, we, it's a player we should be looking at. So, Char Charlie Adams taking the credit for that, though, Lawrence. Um, he was the I mastermind. Think he's played behind that. Before. I think he's played mid Of course he yeah. has. Of course he has. Um, I mean, on that point, though, I, I guess it opens up the wider discussion, uh, Liam, that would suggest that a player needs to leave Scotland to develop to their peak. Would you go with that? I mean, McGinn's yeah. a good example. I think, obviously, Ferguson's an example. Aaron Hickey. Josh Doig, there's loads of examples, but it seems to be at the moment, like Lauren said there, if you had come to Celtic, you could have been in the midfielder's graveyard and not getting a game. Yeah, I mean, you know, £22 million player now could easily become another David Turnbull if he'd come to us. Yes. Um, that's the sad reality of it. And I think Turnbull is a good player who, you know, we certainly didn't use to the best that we could. I mean, every, you know, pretty much every time he came on, he scored. Um, but, um, didn't fit with the the system we were playing and you know that it's 
if you're not going to invest in the coaching, that's as bad as not investing in the players. We, we've talked extensively about not investing in the players, um, you know, the necessary players to get this league over the line. But additionally, for years, we've not really invested in the coaching side of things properly. Ange Postacoglu papered over so many cracks when he was here. Uh, that uh, that has become so clear uh, as this season has progressed. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I criticise Brendan Rodgers, but the guy can only do so much as one man. And it seems to me like he's trying to hold together an, an entire infrastructure at the club that just isn't working at the moment. Um, you know, talk about being prepared for a, a being prepared for a rainy day. The Celtic board are better prepared than Noah at the moment, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, they are. I mean, the final point I would make uh, in relation to that one is that what Ange had, had I think, in, in his... Um, and his corner was the fact that he was bringing in players that he knew and trusted and they made an instant impact. Brennan Rogers coming in during that transitional period seems to have allowed the recruitment team to run with it because they had presented to him that they were good at it and the players that he's been presented with have not met that same kind of standard and they've not made the same impact as well. Um, last comment on this, I'm going to give it over to, no, two more comments. Kevin Graham makes a good one. Celtic, can he give you a business plan for the next five weeks? Never mind 100 years. What, <laughs> what does a 100-year business plan look like? I'd love to have a look at that. Pat Dolan, uh, I've been keeping my pounder dry on all things Celtic for almost four weeks. Flabbergasted how the management team have fashioned this current shambles from Ange Postacoglu's treble season. Elite manager, I. Well, yesterday I was saying it's not over yet. I think there's a few twists and turns in the chase for a Scottish Cup and League double. And I'm pretty sure we'll be there or thereabouts by the end of the season by hook or by crook. 14 to 1500 watching live on the stream. We ran a competition which started yesterday. All you need to do to be in with a chance of winning two VIP tickets to come and see Paddy McCourt at Gracie's in Glasgow is to email me the name of your Celtic cult hero and why. Mings is George's Samaras. Ian, whose is yours? Who's your cult hero for Celtic? Oh, geez. Um, go around the room and it can come back to me. I will. Lawrence, cult hero. Maybe. Sorry? Danny McLean. Danny McLean, cult, he- cult hero? Me, we've all got to be part of the, the, the cult of Danny. Right. The, He's got a cult. Is he a cult hero? He's just a legend. He's just an icon. One of the greatest players that we've ever had. A cult beard. He's definitely got a cult beard. Yeah. There's a man over there with some hair on his chin building a stairway to Hamden. The, the thing with that, remember he almost had to shave it off when we were playing Partizan Tirana in Albania. Does yes, Frank like Ligardi reach the, the criteria? Does he meet the criteria Liam Carrigan of a cult Frank McIverney? What do you mm. think? Uh, would have been top scorer in England, wouldn't he, if I had one of the hand hit penalties? But it, cult, cult, a cult player is someone who often doesn't reach the heights they should have done yeah. with undoubted talent, or it could their be Their endeavour is better, greater than their talent. Their endeavour is better, like Anton Rogan style, or yeah. they have a certain affinity with the crowd. They've got a, they've got a relationship with the fan base. Uh, I think See, that for that reason, it. I would say the holy goalie, Arthur Boric. Holy goalie, brilliant, yeah. Yeah. See, I love this debate because everybody's got a different take on it. There is no definition. So many, yeah, yeah. That, absolutely. What is your definition of a cult hero? Who is your cult hero? Email me at pauljohndykes at gmail.com. Loads of entries came in yesterday. It's a subject I love, and we've got Paddy McCourt coming to Glasgow. First time in five years. Really looking forward to it. If you want to buy tickets, there are a few underneath this video as well. Thank you all for getting involved in the discussion today. As I say, brilliant turnout on a Tuesday afternoon. Thank you to Ian Conroy over in New Zealand, Liam Carrigan in Japan, myself and Lawrence Conley for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind.